Steve Lerner, welcome to the new school at Commonweal. Thank you. This is part of our series of conversations on the Commonweal story. Uh, you and I are brothers. It's true, the, the Loina brothers. The Loina brothers. <laughs> and before we get into Commonweal, I, I have to say that I brought from home one of my most treasured uh, objects. It's one of those things that if there were a fire, I would grab this. <laughs> and it's a photograph of Steve Lerner, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Jean Genet at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago on August 27, 1968. And I'll, I'll pass it around, but Steve is directly behind Allen Ginsberg, uh, sitting um, in the, uh, let's see, so that's Steve right up there. Shanae mm -hmm. is the, the... Burroughs is the middle one, yeah. with the hat on, with the yeah, on. Yeah, always with the hat. Yeah. And I was uh, reporting for the Village Voice at the time. And oh, wow. yeah. Norman Mailer in Armies of the Night yeah. quoted you at length from yeah. your Village Voice reporting and said it was the best reporting done on the yeah. convention. Yeah, that was, those were exciting times. What do you remember of reporting uh, <laughs> from... Uh, from the convention? From the convention. Uh, I remember being gassed mm -hmm. and uh, forced down the street by a, um, a moving blockade of uh, um, uh, army... Um, jeeps and um, armored vehicles with barbed wire on the front of them mm -hmm. that went down clearing the avenues. And I remember sitting in Lincoln Park with Genet and Burroughs and Ginsburg and the tear gas come, canisters coming in and breaking the branches off the trees and coming in and uh, dispersing the crowds. We'll go first to the work. Um, you were really at Commonweal at the very start. Uh, right. You were reminding me you were in the conversations with Burr Hanneman and Carolyn Brown and Susan Dunn yes. at the very start of Commonweal's yeah. work. Well, I'd been working at Full Circle mm -hmm. uh, as a counselor there. Mm -hmm. And um, so this was the beginning of a, a new chapter. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I came out here um, right at the outset and uh, the first order of business was building a fence around the, the water supply. Mm -hmm. And we Burr put together this troop of all kinds of different people from uh, Bolinas to, to work on the fence mm -hmm. and, uh, and get, get things physically started mm -hmm. here. And then we were emptying out these rooms of all the RCA equipment. I mean, this was, a, this was an industrial site. And I think one of, the, one of the interesting things looking back at this environmental health center as it evolved is that we started with a polluted industrial site here. Mm -hmm. in, in this room that we're sitting in were these huge machines uh, many of them filled with toxic chemicals uh, that we had to get out of here. And in addition, uh, RCA had thrown uh, transformers filled with PCBs over the cliff, and we had to get the authorities in to clean stuff up and so on. So we were really working on toxic chemicals from the very first day here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, you were the person who brought in both the state and the National uh, yeah. Environmental Protection Agency and so on, and the Commonwealth site became a major uh, toxic zone, uh, well, or whatever it's called, I site. Don't, I, I don't know about major, but, but it, it was, was a toxic it, there site. There was a cleanup that, yeah. there was yeah. a cleanup that happened yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So uh, what were your... What you mentioned you were working at Full Circle. So Full Circle was the school for delinquent kids that Carolyn and I started out of her previous work at the Growing Mind at Berkeley, where she started right. a, a non-residential school. And then I came out and left teaching at Yale, joined Carolyn, and started Full Circle. 
and we built Full Circle from the ground up in Dogtown in an apple orchard that we bought. Uh, and then you were an early staff person there, pretty early. Fairly early. Mm -hmm. What happened was that you came and visited me in Vermont, mm -hmm. where I had been working in apple orchards and the mm -hmm. Bennington Pottery and at uh, Tool Factory and um, so on, and building my own house and eventually houses for other people. Mm -hmm. And it was part of the Back to the Land movement, mm -hmm. um, grow your own food, chop your own mm -hmm. wood, haul your own water, and so on. And we were doing that and um, building uh, uh, our own community, um, kind of in reaction to the, um, the betrayal of uh, our government uh, uh, military operations in Vietnam and so on. And I think a lot of us felt alienated from society at that time and wanted to do something else. Mm -hmm. And you came and said, you know, we're starting this thing out in California, and mm -hmm. would you like to work with us? And so I packed my tools in the Jeep and drove out to Bolinas. Mm -hmm. Now, even going back before that, um, you and I both went to Dalton School in New York. Uh, um, uh, and then I went to Exeter, you went to Andover, we both ended up at college at Harvard. Then I went on to graduate school, but you took a very different path. Tell us about the path you took. Well, I, um, after college, started working at the Village Voice. Mm -hmm. um, and that got me to the Democratic Convention, mm -hmm. to Woodstock, to um, all of the kind of countercultural um, events that were happening uh, on the East Coast uh, that I covered as a reporter for The Voice. Um, and out of, out of that reporting, I was given uh, money to write a book. And I decided to go on the road to Asia. And I took two years traveling overland to uh, Asia through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and so on. Um, and coming back after two years doing that, I decided to go up to Vermont and uh, um, find a place to live up there. And actually, uh, uh, an artist friend gave me 10 acres to build a house on. Uh, on the side of a mountain. On the side of a mountain. <laughs> you built the house in the middle of the winter. Yeah, well, there were, it took took a long time to build the house. I took mm -hmm. down a bunch of barns and mm -hmm. did, had very little money uh, and did these, um, these jobs with the tool factory and so mm -hmm. on. So that's where you found me when you, mm -hmm. you came out and made this offer. But before we go forward to Commonweal again, um, tell us a little more about the two years in uh, going by land through Afghanistan and so forth to India. What, what are some of your most vivid memories of that period of time? Um, I smoked a lot of hashish. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I can't say I remember it all <laughs> that clearly. But uh, I, I wanted to write about um, a kind of freewheeling movement of people who were uh, traveling to Asia. And there were, they were not exactly tourists, they were travelers. Mm -hmm. And they lived very cheaply and made their way by local transportation across these sometimes quite difficult parts of the world that have become even more difficult to negotiate now. But even then, it was challenging. Um, and I really had a sense of um, both exploring the world and finding out who I was in the process. It was a, a journey of uh, a kind of a, a search, personal search. Um, 
And after two years doing that and getting hepatitis and uh, ending up in a Red Cross hospital in Bangkok. and You came close to dying. I got very, very sick. Mm. Yeah. And uh, um, came back and um, wanted to try something new. Mm -hmm. So that's that was the... Um, back to the land part of it. I had, I had uh, done some reporting about uh, the communes in New England and knew the people who started Liberation News Service and mm. uh, uh, had then gone out and established these farms in Massachusetts. And um, so I had, I had gotten a little glimpse of what that life was like by reporting about it. But I don't like living with large groups of people. And so I was more into a neighborhood than a commune. The thing about arguing over whose peanut butter it is in the refrigerator never really uh, resonated with me. And so I, uh, I, I became part of a small community, a kind of alternative community in Vermont. So when you came to work at Full Circle, the school for delinquent kids, uh, that we started in Dogtown. As a counselor, what are your most vivid memories of Full Circle? Full Circle was hard for me mm -hmm. um, because uh, the kids really needed authority figures. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't a particularly good authority figure. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to befriend the mm -hmm. kids and get to know them. I mean, these were young men who, a number of whom had been at the Youth Authority or in various juvenile um, facilities around the state who were coming to an unlocked facility where you basically had to control sometimes violent behavior by physically restraining kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was hard for me. Mm -hmm. uh, very demanding. One of the things I remember was one of the boys had a, had a, a dog he'd adopted. And when I had to restrain him, he called the dog over and bit me in the face. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were some hard moments there mm -hmm. uh, about uh, figuring out. And, and there were other counselors there who were amazingly good at it. Mm -hmm. I realized this really wasn't the best fit mm -hmm. for me. So when, uh, when a commonweal began to take shape, it began to look like a better deal. It certainly did. Yeah. yeah. Now, we didn't have a lot of money at the beginning of commonweal. Right. We were all yeah. living on very, very little. Yeah. What was living like for you when you started working here? Well, I was living on Overlook in a, uh, in a little house that had been built on the back of a truck. Uh -huh. next to somebody else's house with a garden hose mm -hmm. hookup. Uh, and um, it was pretty skinny that mm -hmm. way. I was beginning to get interested in environmental issues, particularly toxics issues, and had started collecting stories and going over the hill to the uh, public health library at Berkeley. And started um, putting together, uh, typing up on an Olivetti typewriter, uh, a little thing I called working papers that I Xeroxed mm -hmm. and would um, pass out in town and send to people who were interested. It was, um, Smiley Schooner Saloon was our living room because mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a living room at home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was very hand-to-mouth, mm -hmm. I would say, very precarious, mm -hmm. uh, but exciting. Mm -hmm. And the thing I, that appealed to me about Commonweal and this experiment was the aspect of um, having an opportunity to do good work. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And Carolyn Brown took me aside and asked me if I wanted to be of service. And nobody had ever asked me that before. 
So that's how I started. Mm. You know, it's so interesting because now, I mean, it's not like people at Commonwealth get paid a lot of money, but nonetheless, everybody has competitive salaries by nonprofit standards and health insurance and retirement accounts. And it's hard to remember that for a very long time, yes. uh, we didn't have any of that. Right. And it was completely people who were fiercely interested in That's being right. of service, you know. Yeah. It was just, um, and that went on for a long time. Yeah. Actually, we only began to get benefits uh, when uh, the Jennifer Altman Foundation came into being and we were able to afford it. So That's that right. was uh, way later. Yeah. You know? So there was a very long period of time um, yeah. when we were just piecing it together. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what was your first impression of Commonweal when you came out to the site? I thought it looked like this building looked to me like something out of uh, a tropical detective story. Mm -hmm. It looked like a police station in a tropical detective mm -hmm. story. <laughs> and uh, of course there were the, this kind of ghostly field of antennas, many more than mm -hmm. um, there are now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was a strange place, um, but unbelievably beautiful it was. Um, at the same time. So there was this mix of kind of early industrial um, experiment, Marconi bought out by RCA, the whole transmitting to boats in the Pacific, sending signals out along these antennas and so on. So um, it was a very odd place, the brass door with you know, all this um, transmitting equipment in here, all these ancient bulbs and whatnot that they had uh, um, as part of the transmitting uh, equipment. It was a, it, it was a, almost like a science fiction movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said to Burr Henneman, one of the co-founders uh, with us, that when I look back on that whole period of time, I felt like we had to be clinically insane to believe we could pull this <laughs> off. I mean, here we were, a bunch of neo hippies from right. West Moran. Yeah. with no money and no nothing, yeah. who had managed to get a hold of a 50-year lease on this site. Yeah. And, uh, who, um, and here we were with this enormous site with, filled with old transmitters and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And our theory was that we were going to create a center for healing ourselves and healing the earth, you know? <laughs> right. And it was just insane. It was. You know? Yeah. And I, I try to put myself back into the place where we had the courage to do that, you know? Well, I think having um, something physical to do mm -hmm. uh, unleashed energy that, I mean, a lot of people were piecing together livelihoods doing stuff they really didn't want to do. Right. And here again was an opportunity to do something different, something yeah. new, and something that you could feel good about. Yeah. yeah. The idea of the common wheel, the common good, yeah. uh, was very appealing. Right. And I know for myself, I mean, once we succeeded in getting the land, mm -hmm. I mean, it literally was like getting married. There was, there was no turning back. Right. So, I mean... I felt like I didn't have any choice but to go forward because here we were and, you know, yeah. I didn't want it to fail. Yeah. And uh, so I think a lot of the courage just came from the fact that that giving up would have been such a disaster right. that um, it was just like impelled by the force of trying to, trying to make it work. Well, there was also a community that formed. There was a community, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's what gave us the strength to do it. Yeah. 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 It was very collaborative. Yeah. So, in theory, uh, 
you were going to be the first director of the retreat center, but there was no retreat center. Yet. Yes. Yeah. I, I was the king of nothing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so you became the director of the research institute. Well, I started this working papers thing, yeah. which then morphed into common knowledge. And common knowledge was remarkable. Yeah, it. Uh, it was a publication. It, it was. I wish we had some copies, yeah. but uh, it was a quarterly journal on environmental threats to public health, and uh, the first focus was. Um, kind of raising consciousness, uh, raising awareness about fouling the nest and about um, destroying the life support system that we all depend on and uh, being very uh, specific about it and in the process educating ourselves uh, about toxic chemicals and their effect on health. And this may seem very mundane now, uh, but in 1976, it was less well known, uh, less at the forefront of people's um, concerns. And in the process of doing this, of writing endless articles about um, all of the uh, ill effects of industrial chemicals and pesticides and on and on, I developed a reputation in town as uh, the Grim Reaper because I would come to dinner and talk about the formaldehyde outgassing from the plywood under the floor and the, you know, the pesticides and the Guatemalan coffee and the on and on. And um, I, I came to realize that I was focused on the dark side of, uh, in, of our industrial um, society um, and at a certain point felt the need to move on to look for solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of my deepest senses of your actually enormous contribution to Commonweal over many years is that you and David Steinhardt carried um, our commitment to justice more strongly than anybody else here, hmm. you know. I mean, if you just think about it, both in terms of toxic chemicals, in terms of working on the California Youth Authority, Prisoner in Florida. terms of your later books on environmental justice, which we'll come to, but your your book on Diamond, A Struggle for Justice in Louisiana's Chemical Corridor, where we, you and I and others, worked very hard to help a black community move away from a shell chemical plant. Your book, Sacrifice Zones, The Front Lines of, the toxic, of toxic Chemical Exposure in the United States, which won the Lillian Smith Award, a leading environmental justice book award from the Southern Regional Council. Um, you, um, you and David Steinhardt, who directs the Juvenile Justice Program, um, really carried the justice aspect of our work for a mm. very, very long time. Mm. And um, for that, I'm forever grateful. Um, Thank you. So um, one of the things Burr remembers uh, is that uh, one of our earliest projects, Burr Hanneman, co-founder of Commonweal, was... Um, working to stop oil drilling off yeah. the Northern California coast. And according to Burr, mm -hmm. you were the one who identified the issue. And then he said that the three of us made it, were, tried to decide whether we should take it on and that he was against it because he knew what it would entail. Mm -hmm. And he said he lost because you and I pushed it. Mm. And that that was the beginning of the campaign that kept oil drilling off the Northern California right. coast. Lease sale 53. Do you remember how or when you decided this was an issue? Um, well, I'd been to parts of the coast where, <laughs> you know, they had developed oil. Yeah. I'd gotten tar on my feet and, yeah. you know, seen the oil rigs and whatnot. And I didn't want to see it happen here. I heard about, I learned about the lease sale system and 
um, saw that lease sale 53 was going to cover this area as well. Um, so it seemed an obvious uh, thing for us to focus on, and we did we did a you know a big investigation into it and uh, expose about it. Um, that was that was one of them. The other was the Fairlawn Islands radioactive dumping, mm -hmm. which actually journalistically, I mean, I've always seen myself kind of as a journalist and uh, kind of a social justice journalist. Um, and one of the things Commonweal did was that it allowed me the space to go after these stories, which would have been very hard to sell um, uh, to other publications. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really a great gift, that this was a place that provided the resources to do in-depth uh, investigations and reports on these issues, which were critical, but were not being adequately covered. Mm -hmm. So the Fairlawns Islands, which are just off the coast here, was a place where uh, radioactive wastes were put on barges uh, from the Lawrence Livermore Lab and other places uh, w that were doing experiments with radioactive materials. And what they'd do is they'd have 55-gallon drums and they'd throw the, the radioactive chemicals in the drums and then fill them up with concrete. And they'd take the barges out to the Fairlawns and dump them overboard. And so I got a hold of photos uh, that had been taken of these 55-gallon drums on the ocean floor just 20 miles off the coast here that had broken open and the fish were swimming in and out of these drums. Um, so that was the kind of um, reporting we were doing. Uh, and it led, I mean, one thing would lead to another in, in, in the, these explorations. The, the focus then on radioactive pollution, on microwave pollution, on one thing or another, led to a look at uh, the nuclear power plants that were being built. And in particular, Diablo Canyon, uh, a nuclear power plant that was named after the devil and sited on an earthquake fault right next to the coast, uh, seemed an unwise proposition. And so after having spent years writing about you know, the environmental threats to public health of these various different chemical and radioactive pollutants, um, I had an opportunity to join a group uh, in protesting at Diablo Canyon uh, and joined a, um, a group organized by some Quakers um, that went over the fence at Diablo Canyon and was arrested, um, sentenced to three months in prison, and ended up spending three weeks instead in a, in a jail in San Luis Obispo. What was that like? What that did for me, I mean, here's a middle-class white kid who has never been in jail. And I was in a, a cell built for six people that had 20 people in it, sleeping you know, with six chairs around, a, I mean, stools bolted to the floor around a stainless steel table with a toilet r right next to it and a television above it. So when you went to the toilet, everybody's sitting at the table watching the television and you're right under it going to the bathroom. And not enough room to roll out your mattress to sleep. I mean, that kind of crowding. Uh, it was an insane institutional environment. And it led me, when I got out, to write about the institutional environment and how it affects health and behavior. So those were the kinds of um, path pathways that led from 
microwave pollution to radioactive pollution to Diablo Canyon to prisons to institutional environment to then the work um, looking at the reform of the California uh, Youth Authority. Yeah. You know, it just reminds me that we had a wonderful staff member here who died of a brain tumor named Vivekan Flint, mm -hmm. uh, who was a close friend of Waz Thomas. And if memory serves me correctly, Vivekan, I think with Greenpeace, may have parachuted into a Canadian uh, <laughs> nuclear facility <laughs> uh, before he came to work with Commonweal. Huh. Um, that just was a random memory that I wanted to yeah. preserve. Um, he helped me a lot writing um, Choices in Healing, my book about cancer. Mm. So coming back, so this experience, uh, protesting Diablo Canyon, going over the fence with a group of Quaker organized people, getting sentenced to three months in jail, ending up spending six weeks. Three there, weeks. Three weeks there. Yeah. But it was, it was a very formative experience. It was, it was. And that led to the work with the California Youth Authority. That's right. So you actually wrote four books um, on the California Youth Authority. I remember the head of the California Youth Authority uh, introducing us <laughs> to some other people as he said, I don't know if you were there, but he said, uh, he was a nice guy. But he said, this is Michael Lerner and, and Steve or whoever else was there. He said they have an above average interest in the California Youth Authority. <laughs> <laughs> He's a nice guy. Anyway, uh -huh. I have two of them. Uh, one is called uh, Reforming the CIA. The How CYA. To, uh, for the CI, <laughs> CIA wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, right. Idea. Reforming the CYA. How to end crowding diversify treatment and protect the public without spending more money <laughs> by Paul DeMuro and DeMuro and Steve Lerner. Paul was a big Massachusetts right. juvenile justice advocacy yeah. person. And then this important book called Bodily Harm, The Pattern of Fear and Violence of the California Youth Authority. That was the first. That was the first. Yeah. Give people a sense of what the youth prisons of California were like when you started to yeah. write about them. Yeah. Well, um, the Youth Authority started out as a reform movement um, in that the idea was to get um, delinquent youth uh, out in the countryside and have them fight forest fires, uh, or that, that was one of the things they did. Um, but the idea in the beginning was entirely an improved system. Uh, and they built these big facilities um, with dormitories. And um, it was like a, a camp where delinquents went and then when there were fires, they were sent out to work on the fires. And what happened was the population changed um, and it was no longer just kids who were delinquent who had gotten in trouble with the law for one thing or another. It was uh, kids who were affiliated with a variety of, of, uh, of youth gangs. And so the facilities that they built uh, were no longer appropriate for the population, um, and uh, the results were horrendous. Uh, you had... Uh, gang warfare in these um, in these dormitory units, and the only way they could control it was they built these control towers in the middle of the dormitory, 50-man dormitory, uh, which was a, a cage. When at night they'd have a uh, a guard in the cage, locked in the cage, and when things got out of hand they dump tear gas out of the cage and gas 50 young men who are locked in, uh, and then a flying squad would come in and subdue the fighting that was going on. But then by the time that happened, the damage had already been done. The person had been knifed, beaten over the head, 
you know, or whatever. So there was a lot of violence in these facilities. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came in, I did interviews, you know, I immediately asked to go to the infirmary. And there'd be five kids there with their jaws wired shut. Why was that? It's because you put a pool ball in a sock, you know, and walk up behind somebody and hit them in the in the in the face, and it dislocates their jaw. And you know, um, there were what I learned there was that counselors were actually counseling what they called counselors, guards were actually counseling kids in how to stand up and fight for themselves, the, the weaker inmates. And they didn't call them inmates, they called them wards. But they would counsel them to fight until they were unconscious the first time they were confronted. Because if they didn't, they would not be seen to have heart. They would not be seen to be tough enough to get along, and they would be made into a Maytag, you know, do do somebody's dirty laundry or sexual favors or whatever. Uh, so it was a very violent system. The gangs were basically in control of a lot of these facilities. The guards, the the counselors, as they called, them, could not control it. And what struck me was that if you're going to take away somebody's freedom and lock them up you damn well are responsible for their safety. Uh, and this system was not doing that. And again, that just struck me as a huge injustice. Uh, and injustice has never been something that you take kindly to, basically. Um, well, I feel we're all responsible for yeah. it. I mean, it's what we permit to happen. Right. Yeah. But you feel this more strongly than a lot of people do. Well, I don't know if I feel it more strongly um, or uh, I'm, I'm certainly sensitive to it. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I learned as a journalist was that the real um, art of journalism is deciding what you focus on. And... Um, focusing on something like violence in prisons mm -hmm. is a way of deciding who you are mm -hmm. and, and what you want society to be like. Mm -hmm. uh, deciding to spend years writing about toxic chemicals and their effect on health or um, uh, how to create uh, sustainable development. Mm -hmm. uh, these are choices about how you use your life energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are the important choices to me. And that's, again, what Commonweal provided a space for, and that was to be able to make those choices and to do those investigations. We're doing that out with um, the public media was very difficult. I did get, for example, an article on violence in the prison system in the New Republic published. Mm -hmm. But that was really based on the work that I had done mm -hmm. with the California Youth Authority and mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, so when we think about it, just putting things in perspective, you really started by your investigation of lease sale 53. You started the initiative that Commonweal picked up and then others to go on, you started the effort that ended up keeping oil drilling off the coast of Northern California. Well, I, I wrote an article about it. Okay. Yeah. You identified it. Yeah. You brought it up, and then you and Burr and I decided that we should focus on it, and then Burr went on to do a lot of work on it. Right. And then others picked it up. Well, I, I don't claim to have been the only one no, who no. was on the lease sale 53 yeah. story. But yes. Were there others on the lease sale 53? I don't remember yeah. there being. I mean, to me, it was new. Yeah. Uh, but going back, I'm sure somebody was writing about yeah, it. Yeah. I, I, Burr seems to think it began with you. Yeah, could have happened. And, um, and um, 
So I just, I just like to kind of identify those markers. And likewise with the California Youth Authority, where from early on we were working with David Steinhardt, who was then at the National Council on Crime and Delinquency right. as a vice president, and then later came to Commonweal to continue his work. But through David's efforts, building on your books and building on the work all of us did together in the early years on the California Youth Authority, if my memory is correct, and I think I have the facts now correctly, uh, we reduced the population of the California Youth Authority by something like 90%. And um, I think that at the time we started, wasn't it like 6,000? 6, 6,500. 6,500 yeah. young people yeah. in these horrific yeah. conditions. Yeah. So I just, I like to just, you know, it's not hyping it or boasting it about it. It's just saying this happened uh -huh. because of work that we contributed a lot to. There were uh -huh. other people who worked on the Youth Authority also. Right. But clearly David has been the lead on that, sure. and that came out of our collaboration with him on, on the Youth Authority. Yeah. I, by the way, I'm not sure that it's 90% reduction, but mm -hmm. I know that it's a substantial... I think that's David's figure. I've been is it? It's either okay. 80 or 90%. Oh, well, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've been pinning the figure down with David, and it's either 80 or 90%. Well, yeah. I also wrote a book at the end of the Youth Authority series called The Good News About Juvenile Justice, yeah. uh, which was looking around the country at... Uh, um, prison systems for young people who were doing good work and who were figuring out innovative things to do. Um, and a, a lot of the, I mean, a lot of how to reform a prison system is fairly <laughs> um, obvious if you think about it. Uh, um, you decentralize, you put fewer uh, people together in one system. Um, you build smaller facilities and you build facilities that are targeted to treat certain kinds of problems. So you don't put a bicycle thief in with a serial rapist and, you know, expect good things to happen. You, you're discriminating about how you do that. So in all of these investigations, I must say that part of what was going on was self-education in a very public way, uh, self-education about uh, toxic chemicals and health, uh, self-education about the prison system, self-education about race and toxics. And uh, I think that's where we're headed, so I, I'll save that. But mm -hmm. uh, that was a huge part of my education. Mm -hmm. You subsequently did work with Jane Dustin, a longtime friend at the Foundation for Child Development in New York, on acting out adolescents and uh, the uh, geography of foster care in New York. Yes. And we won't spend time on that. Um, and I had forgotten that my mentor, Phil Lee, arranged a grant uh, that took you to Asia to look at toxics for. That's a few right. Months. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was uh, there. I don't know, seven, seven months or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, visited uh, uh, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, India, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And um, went into the regulatory systems that were um, in formation in these countries to inquire about how they were handling uh, industrial chemicals and agricultural chemicals. Um, and in uh, a number of these countries, the, the, um, there wasn't much money to devote to these mm -hmm. uh, issues. And so um, uh, where we had already had a bureaucracy mm -hmm. and uh, a kind of a technical approach to this, um, there were very low-tech uh, approaches to dealing with industry where the government was in a much weaker position to do the regulating than here. Um, and I ended up 
in a number of these places being asked a lot about the way we did it in the United States and, you know, uh, to, to reflect on the way they were doing it. But I also learned how difficult it was to really find out anything um, factual uh, about um, uh, the release of toxic chemicals in a number of these countries because the um, government funded the universities that did the research and they didn't want to let out what mm -hmm. their research showed. So there, there was a total lack of transparency in a number of these countries and very weak enforcement mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's go next to the next big chapter, which was, um, which was the Earth Summit. And so the story there is that after we started Commonweal in 1976, and in 1982, um, our funding collapsed. Both right. the Comprehensive Employment Training Act, which had given us 30 or 40 slots to you know, right. staff Commonweal, mm -hmm. did a huge amount of the work in the first six years. That collapsed at the same time that funding from a major foundation collapsed. So uh, I laid off everybody on the staff except the business manager and the, front, the receptionist laid myself off. We all basically had to leave and go figure out how to make a living. Right while we rebuilt it. And then in 83, um, I got a MacArthur Prize Fellowship and that restored faith in Commonwealth. We began to, Waz Thomas came and we began to rebuild. But um, uh, in about, um, let's see, the Earth Summit was 1992. Yeah, in about and, 1990. And about 1990, um, I remember I was living at the entrance to the Commonwealth Garden then so we'd begun to bring things back together, but it was still skinny. And I was walking home from Commonweal, and I just had this overwhelming sense that we'd had to give up the environment, environmental health work for a number of years. I just had the sense that I couldn't stand it anymore, not having mm -hmm. that piece of the work that, you know, we were doing the work with cancer and other things. Um, I think we'd started that. But in any case, I just couldn't stand it. And mm -hmm. so we began to look around for the entry point. And um, at a certain point, we decided that it was the Earth Summit. Right. I think the other thing that happened, uh, I think that was also when the Jennifer Altman Foundation came into being, but I can't remember if that's the right date. But, but in any case... So we, we started something called the Commonweal Sustainable Futures Group, mm -hmm. which was a remarkable group of people who met to think about the future of the world. And um, the meme for me about that was um, if people got serious about global governance for a just and sustainable world, what map would be out there for them? And we all debated that. There were a number of really interesting conferences here about it. But then the Earth Summit came on the horizon. And that was the great effort uh, to create a sustainable world with a bargain between the North and the South, that the South would not follow a polluting path to development, and the North would provide the resources and technology to do it. And so we were all very involved in that. In mm -hmm. fact, you and I had to leave because our father was dying during the Earth Summit. And yeah. We had to leave in the middle of it. Yeah. But you did two very important books about it. Uh, the Earth Summit, Conversation with Architects of an Ecologically Sustainable Future, and then Beyond the Earth Summit, Conversation with Advocates of Sustainable Development. So tell us about your work on the Earth Summit. Well, I... First, I was living in Washington, D.C., right. uh, and met a woman named Fran Spivey Weber, right. who was um, putting together preparations for non-government groups mm. to be involved in, in the Earth Summit. And so I was interested and began going to these meetings, um, and uh, we all ended up 
uh, going to um, the Earth Summit. But before the Earth Summit, what I had an opportunity to do during the preparatory meetings mm. that were held in New York and in Geneva, um, I um, self-assigned myself to do interviews mm -hmm. with people from all over the world mm -hmm. who were doing the most interesting um, sustainable development work in their countries. And I met just some amazing people, including Wangari Mathai, um, who later became a Nobel Peace Prize winner, mm -hmm. uh, and Vandana Shiva, who later became famous for her eco-feminism work uh, that came out of India, where she had gotten women's groups to protect trees and one thing or another. Um, but just this remarkable group from the Philippines, from uh, one place or another, where um, people already had seen um, that the way forward was uh, to create a, a, a different sustainable path of development and were lobbying for it and putting it into practice in these small projects. Um, so that was the, the work that I was involved with before the Earth Summit started, the actual, so that when we came to the Earth Summit, we had the books to give out as a communication device to let different people know what was happening in different parts of the world. Uh, and that was, that was our contribution at the kind of communications level uh, on this. Let me just mention the names of some of the people in both books. Uh, James McNeil, who was the executive director of the Brundtland Commission report, which created the term sustainable future, um, uh, was one. Jessica Tuckman Matthews, uh, Herman Daly. Um, the World Bank, uh, the reformer of the World Bank. Juni Kalau, Maximo Kalau, very, very from, close friend. From the Philippines. From the Philippines. Um, I was very involved with his death from cancer. He was a very close friend of Catherine Porter's, a longtime friend of ours. Uh, and then uh, Lester Brown from World Watch Institute, Al Gore, who was then a senator, Maurice Strong, Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, Gus Speth, the head of the World Resources Institute. You mentioned Mongari Matai. Uh, so th this was... Uh, Thomas Lovejoy, uh, Secretary for External Affairs at the Smithsonian. Oren Lyons, a chief of the Onond Onondaga Nation. Uh, Martin Kaur, a very great uh, leader on third world development, coordinator of the Third World Network. Uh, those are some. But your list was prescient in many respects. And, and this, again and again, you did what you did for us both in environmental justice and on the Youth Authority and on the Earth Summit, just to take three leading examples, you created uh, the intellectual infrastructure that enabled us to be taken seriously because we could put a book of yours on the table mm -hmm. and say, here's who Steve Lerner has talked to about the Youth Authority, about environmental justice, about uh, the Earth Summit. And right. That created a tremendous credibility for an organization that didn't have a great deal of institutional credibility mm -hmm. like the big NGOs going into these conversations. Yeah, it's good to have a book to bang on the to table. To bang on the table. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So what did you learn from the Earth Summit process? That international um, government government move incredibly slowly in this just stupid and arcane way, mm -hmm. uh, that if we pin our hopes on that, good luck to all of us, mm -hmm. um, but that it's critical to have the governments of the world get together and begin to shape 
an outline of the direction in which we should be going, even if they can't agree totally to sign off on it. And I also learned a lot about the arrogance of the United States mm -hmm. uh, in all of this. And I did uh, an exit interview with the U.S. ambassador who was kind of the ambassador to the uh, UNCED, the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. And asked Which was him, the Earth Summit. Yeah. And I asked him, you know, um, whether the ideas about sustainable development were something that he, th he thought we could take seriously in the United States. And he said, oh, um, sustainable development is not for us. We're already developed. Uh, mm -hmm. And we already have uh, a regulatory infrastructure. Um, both statements were true in one way, uh, but it missed the heart of the matter and that that was we were really central to the problem that the world faced uh, in terms of using resources, creating vast amounts of pollution and causing the problems, the, the global environmental problems that we now face. And this arrogance that, you know, sustainable development, well, that's for developing countries and not for us, um, really got under my skin. And I came back, and what I really wanted to do was I wanted to spend the next five years traveling all over the world writing about sustainable development. And it would have been a great life. I mean, you know, going to the Philippines and writing about what they're doing there, going to North Africa or one place or another. I mean, there was, this was an area untouched uh, in, in <clears throat> journalism largely. And I had all kinds of connections and felt perfectly positioned to do it. And then I thought about it, and I thought, what's the source of the problem? We are the source of the problem. And uh, so what about sustainable development in the United States? Wouldn't that be a good idea? And who is doing it? And so I began a, uh, um, another intellectual journey in which I went around the country looking for uh, people who were doing practical things to put sustainable development into place. And I called it eco-pioneers. Which came out from MIT Press after a long period of, of books that we had published. That's right. But this was a breakthrough book from, eco, from MIT Press, which, which did very well. It was an introduction by Jonathan Lash, who was then the head of the World Resources Institute. And uh, talk a little about who you talked to. Mm. John Todd, for example. Yeah, John Todd was a, a, a man who believed that you could use a, a gravity, a biological gravity-fed system to clean water using plants and fish and other organisms um, to uh, take up the nutrients and sequester the toxic chemicals so that basically you could have uh, municipal wastes coming into a greenhouse at the top and going through these marshland-like reeds and uh, plants of one kind or another, fish tanks and on and on, and that the water would come out the other end would be clean enough to release without problem into a stream. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't recommend drinking it, but he did say, this water is clean enough that you can put it in the stream. Uh, a remarkable man who um, developed these very inventive systems of uh, creating like a little raft with a, um, a windmill on the top that you put on a polluted lake that would go around and churn up the water and um, basically uh, deal with a lot of the algal problems and whatnot. A uh, really remarkable man. You talked to Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez, who wrote Your Money or Your Life, which was an extraordinary yeah. book. Yeah. She remains a friend. She lives up on Whidbey. Yeah. And Your Money or Your Life was really a, 
a seminal piece of work yeah. on how to live on very, very, very little money. money. Yeah. yeah. And and the the point was that a dollar was a lien against nature. Every 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 dollar you spend, in in some sense, um, it, it's going to move something that has to do with nature. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you reduce your personal consumption of things that you don't necessarily need but mm -hmm. might want, um, you can reduce the stress on, mm -hmm. on, on the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I met a lot of interesting people. It was a beautiful book. Doing this. So that led to uh, the last large chapter of what you did at Commonweal, which was the work on environmental justice. And uh, the book uh, Diamond, A Struggle for Environmental Justice in Louisiana's Chemical Corridor and Sacrifice Zones, the Front Lines of Toxic Chemical <coughs> Exposure in the United States. Um, let me give a little preface to the Diamond book. Um, when my friend and colleague Gary Cohen and I uh, uh, were thinking about the environmental health and justice movement in the United States. And it seemed really important to identify a place in the, uh, uh, around Louisiana or Mississippi uh, which was prime for a strategic struggle over environmental justice for black people. And so um, we traveled around uh, Louisiana and uh, with some other extraordinary people um, and looked at different environmental justice struggles, of which there were many. Um, and we came to um, this town called Norco, um, where um, a black community was right next to a shell chemical plant. We were with Monique Hardin, who uh, was a great African-American attorney down there, still very active, and Wilma Subra, uh, again, an ongoing colleague. And um, the situation was so blatant in Diamond that it was a completely segregated community. There was the white part of town, and all the white people there had jobs with... Um, uh, with uh, Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, one way or another. And the black community was right next to the chemical plant. There was a cracker project on one side, chemical plant on the other. They were right next to the chemicals. They got the fumes first. And um, I went to visit the woman uh, who... Uh, Margie what, Richards. Margie Richards, who subsequently won a Goldman Prize for her work for citizens of Norco. And she took me, she, her house was right on the front line of the plant. And by the way, I felt dizzy within 10 minutes of being there. Mm -hmm. And my glasses, the protective plastic cover on my glasses, bubbled, mm -hmm. you know. So, like, and she took me next door where there had been a house. Mm -hmm. And in that house, an elderly black woman had lived, and there was a young black man who had, a, a boy who had been mowing her yard when a, fu a fume from the plant ignited. And it burned him to death and it burned her to death. And Shell, I forget exactly what it was, but they gave, I don't want, they gave a pittance to the family mm -hmm. and they never apologized. No. And I had this experience of just, <laughs> you know, like, you, I had this experience of this just isn't right. Yeah. So I wrote a letter to the head of Royal Dutch Shell and said, you have these beautiful ads in The Economist about what a good neighbor you are in these communities, mm -hmm. um, and you can't possibly know what's going on in Norco. And, you know, I didn't get a response. Mm -hmm. So by this time, we had the Jennifer Altman Foundation, and it gave me a very tiny foundation, but it gave me some standing in the fund funder community. So I asked my funder friends if they would come down to Norco and look at it with me. Mm -hmm. Well, the head of the Shell Foundation heard about this, very nice man named Kurt Hoffman, and he called me up and asked if he could come along because he was friends of 
of, of uh, mm -hmm. some of these other funders. And um, so I said, sure, you know. And so we had a meeting with the head of the local plant and the, and the uh, head of uh, U.S. Shell from Texas and Kurt Hoffman from the International Shell and, um, and a few of us. And working with Margie Richards and her citizen group and a whole set of allies, uh, we made Diamond into a, into a civil into a justice struggle. Mm -hmm. And again, you wrote the book about it. Yeah, you wrote the book. What did you learn from uh, your reporting in Diamond? Well, f first, I'd, I'd point out that the people who made it an environmental justice struggle were the people in Diamond who organized, went door to door, and... Uh, um, Sorry, I'm not sure what you said. And, and created the grassroots movement. There's no question about yeah, I that, just, but I, they, had been, they had been stymied for no, years. No, I'm, I'm not yeah. detracting right. at all from... Yeah. From what you're saying, yeah. what I'm saying is that um, that there had been a long history before any of us right. got involved. Uh, I think it's important to point that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. Uh, you suggested I go down to mm -hmm. Diamond um, and uh, look around and and see if if there was something I could write about there. And it was. It was an extraordinarily in-your-face, blatant case of environmental racism. And I'd been introduced to the uh, environmental justice issue when I was doing some work for this group called the Trust for Public Land. And they, they had asked me to do um, a monograph on the economic benefits of open space. And part of that was looking at um, uh, how open space was apportioned, and part of that I began to look at the race issue and how. And it led me to the United Church of Christ's study on, um, on pollution and race, and how um, uh, people of color are disproportionately exposed to toxic chemicals in this country, and you can map it. <laughs> And Bob Bullard, uh, who came out of Texas, had done just that. He had mapped how um, low-income people of color were disproportionately exposed to toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. So as the kind of the intellectual overview, uh, that was already in place. And I, I had begun to um, get to know some of the people in the field who were um, the chief movers and shakers in the mm -hmm. environmental justice movement. So going into Diamond uh, was an incredible personal experience. Um, and uh, really um, began to expose to me uh, just how racist our system is. Uh, and that we allow... Um, this to continue to this day, that we allow low-income people of color to live right on the fence line with heavy industry and military bases that, that emit huge amounts of pollution. Uh, and many of these people cannot afford to move uh, because they're in public housing that's built right there on the fence line with toxic chemicals. Uh, and if they do move, they lose their place in, in public housing. That, that this this is something that's happening on our watch, and it's an intolerable situation. So Diamond kind of put a face on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, through um, a woman named Ann Rolfus, who ran the Louisiana Bucket Brigade in, um, uh, in New Orleans, uh, who had been doing a great deal of work in uh, Diamond, she introduced me around. And, you know, people at first wondered, who the hell is this white guy? 
you know, and what's he doing here, and does he work for Shell? And, you know, there was a great deal of suspicion early on, but I, I was brought in by people who had credibility, uh, and gradually um, people began to talk to me. And I did 50, 70 interviews, uh, in-depth interviews with, with people there, um, and got to know uh, about the um, chemical explosions. They had the uh, they had a refinery there that basically blew up uh, and killed eight people and um, injured a lot of other people and flattened houses throughout town, terrified everyone. Uh, and they had um, you know other chemical explosions where the top of a chemical tank would come flying over the fence line into a playground, you know, uh, in, in Diamond. Uh, they had a whole series of accidents that they could point to and say, this is what happens when you live here. But the real issue was the day-to-day -day, um, uh, um, pollution, which was very hard to prove. And so this group, uh, the Bucket Brigade group, run by a man named Denny Larson, who I'd gotten to know here in San Francisco, uh, um, did prove it. And they captured samples using citizens who had been trained to use these buckets that they capture air samples in and then send them off to the labs. They were able to prove that they were being intoxicated with uh, illegal, illegally high levels of toxic chemicals. So that's that's basically the this the book is the story of this struggle for relocation, and with uh, the help of Michael and his group of funders and uh, um, other um, connections. Well, it was the NGO network that really drove it, right? And, and I. I you were right to correct me because I was speaking shorthand. Yes. The fact is that until we showed up that Concerned Citizens of Norco, Margie Richards' group, which deserves all the credit, she got the Goldman Award, but they had made no progress with Shell over yes. many, many years. And likewise, as you well know, there are many other places, Mossville and others, that likewise could make no progress against right. these powers. So what I attribute it to, uh, the project progress, because we really did enable the, the black community to get the same prices for their homes that those homes would have been worth if they weren't next to a chemical plant. Right. Shell bought them out. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, um, and what, we provided was the leverage to get Shell to engage with concerned citizens of Norco. The, all the negotiations were between concerned citizens and Shell. Right. But they hadn't been able to get the leverage to do that. And, and isn't it interesting yeah. that in order to have the leverage, yeah. you need a bunch of white people with money you to do. come in and yeah. to get Shell's attention and get them to the bargaining yeah, table. Yeah, and that is and the heart of what that is, is wrong. That's, what, yeah. that's the heart of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and here you have environmental justice struggles across the country. Which don't get that. With you know, hundreds and hundreds of these sites yeah. that didn't get the yeah. kind of help yeah. that you were yeah. able to help bring yeah. in. So that's, that's the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. The bigger picture is the institutionalized racism. Yeah. Uh, that allows these situations to continue um, without relief. And it is important to say that there are places where without uh, white people with money that communities of color do manage to get the leverage to make change. It, 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 certainly it happens. It happens, but it's much it, it harder. It happens both yeah. ways. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. So from Diamond... Um, I decided that Diamond was just one of uh, uh, a large number of, of, of places with the similar kinds of problems. And while I was doing the Diamond book, I was reading about all kinds of other places that were facing similar problems. Um, 
and also reading about the discrepancies between the way white communities that had toxics problems were treated than communities of color were treated. Um, and that led me to do the Sacrifice Zones book, um, looking at a dozen uh, case studies of, um, uh, of these kind of fence line stories around the country. And you did uh, Ocala, Florida, Penascola, Florida. Uh, Pena, how do I say that? Penas, Penas, Pensacola, Pensacola, Florida. Pensacola, yeah. Port Arthur, Texas, Corpus Christi, Texas, Addison, Ohio, Marietta, Ohio, Talavast, Florida, San Antonio, Texas, Daly City, California, St. Lawrence Island, Alaska, Greenpoint, New York, and uh, the cluster communities issues, and Fallon, Nevada. Um, uh, of all those, uh, why don't we pick the St. Lawrence Island in Alaska as uh, one that you did? Tell us a little about St. Lawrence Island. Well, um, St. Lawrence Island is in the Bering Sea. Um, it's a quite a large island off the coast of Alaska, part part of Alaska, an Inuit um, community that. Um, uh, lives off fishing and hunting and gathering greens and reindeer herding. Um, and this is a, you know, community that has sustained itself mm -hmm. uh, um, off the land and the ocean. They're, they go out and they kill walruses and skin them and make boats out of them and go out and kill whales and drag whales back in and you know, they can make it through the winter. 